गुड इवनिंग शुड वी स्टार्ट हेलो ओके सो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन वेलकम टू द डिस्टेंस लर्निंग प्रोग्राम ऑफ इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ रिमोट सेंसिंग देहरादून on today's topic uh, i will be discussing uh, various applications of remote sensing and gis in hydrology and uh, water source uh, management so in this uh, uh, talk today uh, i will be talking briefly about the hydrological cycle and the water balance uh, which is basically essential to plan and manage our water sources in a given uh, geographical unit whether it is a, a given household city uh, watershed river basin or uh, on the entire planetary scale where we talk about the long term uh, climatic changes uh, second uh, part will be on This the water available will now be recorded will be on water availability uh, status and what are the gap areas and then i will briefly touch upon the various earth observation systems uh, which are uh, conventionally used for uh, water source uh, management and then a brief about uh, the geo portals which has been uh, developed by isro in collaboration with central water commission and other uh, water agencies and how uh, followed by the what are the various hydrological uh, parameters and variables which we can derive directly from remote sensing and a brief uh, study on the water source assessment that is surface water and snow cover assessment of the uttarakhand and uh, how we can use uh, remote sensing gis and various uh, meteorological hydrological and hydraulic models uh, to study and uh, forecast uh, hydrometeorological disasters using uh, remote sensing and uh, finally uh, uh, for, followed by the summary of uh, remote sensing uh, gis Uh, and their role in the uh, modeling and uh, lastly i will touch upon the various sensors uh, which are planned in future uh, as well as uh, currently operating which give us the important uh, physical parameters uh, related to the water sources and hydrological cycle so if you see uh, our uh, earth we call it as a water planet uh, more than 74% of the earth uh, surface is uh, covered with the water and it is the unique uh, planet where the water is found in the liquid state uh, that is why uh, uh, it harbors uh, such a wide variety of life whether in the uh, land area whether in the oceans or sometimes in the atmosphere as well so out of this water 97% is saline fresh water constitutes only the 3% and out of that 3% uh, the most of the fresh water it is uh, located uh, in the ice caps and glaciers uh, uh, in the polar regions and the, in the high mountainous uh, regions and the ground water uh, constitutes the 30% of the fresh water and rivers soil moisture and atmospheric water constitute in only the approximately 1% and within this fresh water the lakes will contribute the highest followed by swamps and the 2% so uh, remote sensing will help us to uh, closely monitor this uh, limited amount of uh, fresh water which is very essential for the well being of the uh, human being as well as the other uh, ecosystem that we uh, see uh, and uh, that gets water uh, for its essential uh, uh, life uh, and the uh, various uh, components so uh, this hydrological cycle uh, there are two components uh, of the hydrological cycle or the two types of what we can call now uh, few hundreds of years uh, back when there was less number of interventions that is human interventions uh, were there then most of the hydrological cycle is in the natural state Uh, for example you have the precipitation and then you have the evapotranspiration uh, evaporation from the open waters uh, that leads to the formation of the clouds and then through the various uh, circulation systems uh, working at the planetary scale or some orographic systems or weather systems like we have the monsoon systems so they will transport those clouds uh, uh, and then this clouds will form uh, and then precipitation in the high reaches it will be as a snowfall 
in the lower reaches it will be as a rainfall depending upon the altitude and latitude so once uh, there is a accumulation of the snow in the spring time it will melt and similarly if there is a rainfall it will uh, infiltrate into the soil and then depopulation into the groundwater so this is the natural uh, systems and in between we can have the uh, uh, infiltration uh, transpiration from the uh, vegetation and uh, evaporation from the soil uh, and from the open water bodies and then ultimately that river uh, water will meet to the sea and this groundwater either it will meet to the river or it will meet to the ocean area. So this is the basic uh, water balance equation where precipitation plus if you add the irrigation component in the man-made system it is equal to the ET uh, infiltration plus uh, surface runoff and change in the storage. So the second part of this uh, hydrological cycle is the engineered water cycle. So here in the upstream area, we usually do not have the major engineering structures, only the natural uh, uh, water cycle dominates. But as we come down the slope, you see a lot of agriculture area along the rivers and that agriculture area will contribute to the evapotranspiration, then the runoff from that agriculture area that may have the nutrients, then this water will be used for the manufacturing, it will be used for the municipal water use, drinking, energy uh, treatment, and also the wastewater treatment. So this is the uh, uh, impact of the humans uh, on the uh, natural uh, water cycle. So uh, this uh, runoff in the urbanized area, as you know, the infiltration will be less. So uh, runoff will be very high and urban ET is different than the natural ET. That means you have the impact of urban heat islands. So this blue one is the natural resources and the black one are the urban uh, fluxes and the infrastructure. So uh, in between we have the groundwater flow, confined or unconfined. And uh, when uh, it meets to the human systems, this groundwater also undergoes a change. Uh, it is not naturally flowing out of the groundwater aquifer, but it is extracted uh, predominantly for uh, drinking water uh, as well as for the irrigation. So this uh, uh, changes the various uh, quantities of the water that we see in the natural system as compared to the engineered uh, water cycle. So, uh, uh, as I told, uh, this water will be used basically two primary uses, the agriculture, that is the major consumption of the water. And you can see if you want to grow a particular crop or if you want to uh, make a cotton t-shirt where the cotton will be used, how much amount of water will be used. So, uh, similarly, the second is the domestic sector, third is the industrial and other uses. So, to uh, quantify and manage our surface water, whether from the surface water coming from the rivers or springs or from the groundwater, uh, we have to uh, see each of this uh, water use uh, either through the construction of the uh, reservoirs uh, or the barrages or through the groundwater. So this water requirement have to be uh, taken care of. The only problem that uh, the distribution, uh, spatial distribution of the water, which is primarily coming from input rainfall or the snowfall. So that specially highly distribution is there. That means uh, at present in the northern India, you see uh, this uh, air quality problem is coming. There is no precipitation. But if you see at the same time, Tamil Nadu is having, uh, under the flooded condition. So, uh, due to the geographical, uh, unique geographical uh, and topographical condition of India, we have large variation in the precipitation and uh, most of our rains uh, throughout the India will occur during the monsoon. That is the only, uh, only two to three months our entire uh, rainfall will occur. So, there can be situation uh, where can, uh, in a country one area is under drought and one area is having the floods. So this is the total spatial distribution uh, where uh, in the uh, slides I will show how these maps are generated. Generally, uh, we have the traditional rain gauges which will observe the uh, rainfall data on hourly to daily time scale. And then we do the spatial interpolation. So this is the Indian Meteorological uh, uh, Department. They have the rain gauge network uh, throughout the country and they use uh, some interpolation techniques, spatial interpolation to get the rainfall at, uh, for example, publicly available, it is at the 0.25 degree daily scale. 
So you can see here, June to September is the main time period where most of the country is receiving the water. And in the October, November, and in uh, we get the uh, Tamil Nadu and other areas, we get the rainfall. And January to March, uh, sometimes in April also, we can, northern part of the India, they will receive a precipitation which includes um, a majority uh, as a snowfall. Uh, due to the northwestern disturbances or uh, now we call it winter monsoon. So we can see the western part, uh, if you see the annual rainfall, it is uh, under the arid condition and the east moon, uh, most part is under the wet condition. That is northeast is having the excess water and some part of the central India, western India are under the arid condition including some part of the layer the dark as well, that is the cold desert part. And the western ghats, uh, the northwest Himalaya, the eastern parts, uh, East India and um, uh, all the northeast, they are the water surplus uh, states for the geographical regions. So if you see the total water availability, uh, so we have the 2.4% of the land area, uh, population is uh, to 17%, but we have only the 4% of the water and our per capita ranking is 132 and uh, this is the total uh, precipitation which is uh, available and out of this uh, utilizable uh, water uh, from surface uh, plus uh, ground water is 690 and 433 and the storage uh, under the utilizable 253 so uh, we have the estimated water need of uh, 1450 by 2050 and at present we have the uh, utilized water of 1123 so this gap area uh, can be uh, filled by interlinking of the rivers so this is the uh, one of the uh, uh, areas where the future water source management will be the major uh, uh, boost uh, to the overall management that means to fill up the gap area uh, by increasing the efficiency of the irrigation and uh, less wastage of water plus this deficient uh, by 2050 by interlinking uh, of the rivers. So uh, to map and monitor such a diverse uh, water resources as we see in India, space is the ideal uh, platform to monitor in near real time. So why? because it gives us uh, the information uh, about the uh, particular uh, weather system or uh, clouds which vary within few minutes to hours uh, and the surface water or the reservoirs rivers which may take few days to uh, change uh, in their surface extent or the volume so uh, this information from few hours to few days uh, can be uh, Im immediately uh, taken care by uh, various uh, geostationary and the polar orbiting satellites. Similarly, temporal uh, information uh, is there, 30 minutes, now it is 15 minutes to few days. And spatial resolution, if you want to see the clouds, you can use the geostationary, which is in kilometer, and if you want uh, have information about the water infrastructure, you can go one meter or below this. And if you want to cover entire country in a single go, you can take the geostationary white swath or the polar orbiting white swath images like AWIFs and uh, 25 kilometers if you want to monitor the high resolution particular infrastructure project. So uh, from few days to few hours, from a swath of few kilometers to few thousands of kilometers, so remote sensing will provide the, all the information. So uh, this uh, water balance we discussed previously was the simple uh, water balance, but if we want to quantify various components using the uh, remote sensing. So here there are two modules. We have the water balance, so we have the energy balance, and this water balance uh, generally will have the some uh, remaining part uh, uh, that is change in the storage. So that remaining part can be easily closed by remote sensing. For example, for soil moisture, you can use the passive microwave sensors, active passive microwave sensors. For the precipitation, there are dedicated satellites like TRMM, GPM, INSAT. Evaporation, uh, we have the humidity infrared sounders. Uh, for the transpiration, uh, we have the optical sensors with the thermal band like Landsat uh, and for the runoff, we have the altimeter for the groundwater. We have the GRACE uh, series of uh, satellites for the clouds. 
uh, water vapor we have inset and uh, airy sensor for the surface temperature again there are uh, different suite of sensors like AIRS and both these and for the radiation the long wave radiation we have ARS and AMSU so all these uh, uh, satellite components uh, will give us change in the water storage with respect to time and other components uh, can also be estimated directly or indirectly using uh, remote sensing so uh, uh, these are the some of the imaging capabilities of uh, india for example this 36000 kilometers is the geostationary so they uh, will have the uh, orbital uh, uh, time similar to the rotation of the earth so that uh, you can see uh, indian disk uh, permanently so if you have the inset 3d and 3d r two satellites in that particular uh, longitude range so you can get uh, indian uh, data sets every 15 minutes so this is the main workhorse for the indian meteorological department and other uh, water related missions which uh, have the requirement of monitoring the satellite based uh, precipitation and satellite based energy components uh, which are dependent on the thermal water vapor and the visible images similarly uh, this orbit is also used for the satellite communication then we have the LEO orbit where the high resolution and all weather mapping satellites like the radar imaging satellites, the optical imaging satellites, they will be used. And then we have the airborne system where the airborne uh, laser uh, altimeter and other near real time mapping uh, airborne instruments are used, which will give you very high resolution data of the uh, elevation as well as for the images. So these are the some of the uh, satellites, uh, remote sensing mission and corresponding applications in the water sources. So one of the oldest application is potential groundwater prospect zones, uh, which has been uh, delineated using earlier uh, using Landsat data and later on that has been uh, uh, methodology that was developed with the Landsat data for uh, potential groundwater prospect zones as well as for the snow melt runoff and glacier inventory that was carried forward for the IRS 1A 1B series from 1988 onwards. So uh, then uh, with the IRS 1C 1D we had the highest uh, civilian remote sensing satellites uh, with the IRS fan giving the 5 meter resolution data. So that was used for the command area monitoring such as reverse segmentation and in the phase 2 we had this groundwater prospecting for more uh, states at 50,000 uh, scale mass balance of the snow and glaciers then interbasin uh, water transfer, water corridors, irrigation infrastructure planning and finally the water source uh, uh, planning and uh, management and water budgeting using satellite data and uh, apart from the uh, optical remote sensing satellite from coarse moderate to high resolution uh, from 2008 onwards uh, uh, we had this uh, uh, very high resolution satellites so 2012 we have the radar imaging satellites uh, we have megatropics we have several Altica and now we have scat set uh, series of the satellites uh, plus so we have the uh, stereo imaging uh, satellite which gives us the uh, precise and uh, high resolution topographic data which is very much essential for uh, hydrological studies so this is the overall uh, summary of the applications that uh, we uh, can think of uh, in water sources and hydrology. You can map the surface water. Some of these studies I will highlight in my uh, slides uh, presentation today. And uh, uh, some uh, may not be covered because of the shortage of the time. So uh, starting from the surface water mapping, monitoring, including water quality studies, then watershed characterization and monitoring. All the watersheds uh, earlier they used to be uh, monitored traditionally using the remote sensing uh, for the land use land cover and topo sheets for the uh, elevation or the boundary of the watershed. But nowadays we have the cartosat based digital elevation models and other publicly available digital elevation models uh, which give us the easy tools to delineate the watershed boundary as well as uh, 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 calculate the their various uh, morphometric uh, parameters. 
then we have the hydrological parameter retrieval as i discussed previously in the uh, slide about the water cycle like uh, these many parameters we can derive from the remote sensing directly and indirectly microwave remote sensing uh, where the hydrological parameters and operational flood mapping are part of it snow glacier mapping melt runoff modeling surface runoff and erosion modeling hydrological modeling and hydraulic modeling for the floods a rain water water harvesting structure and other uh, water source related projects their site suitability irrigation infrastructure mapping and water management flood mapping modeling and forecasting drought monitoring and prediction so these are the some of the list where remote sensing is used extensively and some of the applications are operational uh, with the user agencies uh, uh, because a lot of research has been done and uh, they have been accepted by the main water agencies like central water commission and the state water management agencies so for example irrigation infrastructure monitoring irrigation potential how much it has been created command area reservoir sedimentation so that has been uh, implemented and operationally used by the agencies and snow and glaciers monitoring river monitoring groundwater potential uh, mapping so these are the some of the examples uh, where uh, remote sensing uh, based uh, information has been uh, operationally uh, used for creation of the basic thematic maps as well as uh, deriving the additional information for example reservoir sedimentation uh, snow melt runoff modeling flood forecasting and groundwater prospecting so uh, uh, just to cover the basics uh, if we see the optical remote sensing whether you see in the google earth or uh, any uh, landsat or our indian remote sensing satellites in the optical domain so these are the basic three features that we see we see the vegetation clear water or the uh, soil so this clear water will have the least of the reflectance as compared to the uh, natural vegetation or the natural or the bare soil because it is absorbing most of the electro uh, magnetic uh, energy and it is reflecting only the visible part that is 0 0.4 to uh, 0.8 and highest reflectance in blue to green uh, part so if you see uh, in a satellite image the deep water will look dark blue to black and uh, this uh, sediment laden water uh, will look uh, brownish and this is a typical image uh, where we can see the delta of uh, ganges and brahmaputra you can see the water in all the three phases that is liquid phase here we can see over the meghalaya and lower bangladesh in terms of the clouds uh, water vapor phase and here we can see in the frozen that is solid state in the snow and the glacier uh, uh, type so uh, we have the wide swath for example modis or the avis kind of satellite those can give you the complete basin level uh, coverage so this uh, uh, remote sensing derived information is the land use land cover the elevation uh, and what we want to represent we want to represent the uh, we want to represent the uh, uh, real world uh, in a geographical information system um, with information combined from remote sensing and ground based points which are collected using the gps uh, data sets so these uh, characteristics uh, they have the spatial variation as well as the temporal variation that's why uh, we call them uh, spatio temporal uh, variables so this spatial variation is mostly in the physical layers like soil land use drainage elevation so um, predominant uh, uh, this uh, variation is in space whereas the climate it will have the, the both space as well as the uh, uh, temporal domain it will be varying and if you combine this with the time factor and uh, add some mathematical equations uh, which will uh, uh, resolve uh, for the movement of water from the atmosphere to the land from the land uh, over the surface and underground ultimately to the river from the river to the oceans and again from the surface of the water to the atmosphere so we call this uh, uh, hydrological uh, modeling so uh, this is the basic layers where combination of raster and vector data is combined to represent the real world so this uh, real world the first uh, the first uh, characteristics is the digital elevation models uh, that is the digital representation of the topography so these days it is available for all entire globe uh, even uh, it is available for moon from chandrayaan 1 chandrayaan 2 and it is available for mars 
and it is available for many planetary bodies because remote sensing satellites they have the two basic sensors one is the imaging camera it is in mostly it is optical in multispectral and sometimes in hyperspectral uh, wavelengths and second is the terrain mapping if it is the solid uh, planets like we have the uh, 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 solid planets uh, from mars up to uh, mercury and the asteroidal belt so these uh, cameras and if you have the thick atmosphere you may carry the radar also so this uh, topographical information uh, can be used uh, easily to detect the drainage network because drainage uh, topography in earth is heavily influenced by the impact of the water and the impact of the seismicity or the uh, this uh, deformation uh, tectonic uh, deformation so uh, this uh, tools are available which will help us to derive the watershed boundary, subbasin boundary, drainage network, slope, aspect, uh, and because these digital elevation models are available for entire SAR countries and uh, globally also, so uh, whatever the basin boundary outside the administrative boundaries of India or a particular state, that can also be derived using the freely available software. So all this data, uh, which is derived from remote sensing, whether it is a basin boundary, whether it is surface water, groundwater, river, or the actual water source projects, uh, they have been uh, made operationally available to all the concerned uh, agencies, whether it is in academia or whether uh, it is in the industry or the government uh, departments. So this uh, FOU was signed between ISRO and Central Water Commission in December 2008 when uh, ISRO uh, made this uh, Indian... Uh, uh, water resource information system, a web GIS portal, and then uh, uh, all the database of Central Water Commission, IMD, Central Groundwater Board that was populated into this. And from 2016 onwards, uh, uh, this uh, India Waris is now managed by the National Water Information uh, Center as part of the Ministry of Jal Shakti. So you can create the username and password and you can derive all the information and download also the real-time information about the various uh, water uh, layers. So, for example, some of the layers I am uh, showcasing here, the river basin atlas, it is available. Uh, so, uh, if you want to know what your uh, river basin uh, is there and what are those boundaries, you can directly request this India Wari website. You can get the pre-printed uh, maps uh, as well. As if you want to make your own maps, that is also possible. Uh, you can generate your study area map uh, and you can also request for the uh, GIS based data of uh, these uh, shape files uh, if you have the uh, right uh, credentials. And these are the earlier, it was very difficult because some of these basins are classified, some are uh, non classified. So the uh, classified basins are those where water is uh, going into the international waters. For example, Brahmaputra, Ganges, uh, this Indus River Basin and in uh, here uh, Kaveri Basin because we have the uh, two states uh, competing uh, interests. So that uh, data, uh, uh, you have to make a special request. You cannot download directly from the India forest. So, uh, but if you want to uh, do not know the location where the gauging site is located, so it is very difficult to even request that data. So, India Waris contains all the locations uh, where the discharge, sediment, water quality or the existing water source project, whether it is dam, barrage or any kind of water source project is there. So, this is an example of uh, Ganga Basin. So, you can know this and once you know the location, uh, the attributes, you can request the concerned agency, whether Central Water Commission or some state water authority, uh, which can uh, help you to get this data for your particular study. So, then there are uh, various uh, subcategories of the basin, region, uh, sub-basin, watershed, micro-watershed that can also be uh, coded uh, values are there. You can use this standardized codes to uh, do your particular study. And the real-time information about the water levels, this uh, whitish uh, symbol, uh, symbols are showing the non-classified where you can use the data in near real time without any restriction. These basins are the classified where uh, you have to uh, request uh, the particular agency for the data set. And apart from this, there are multiple uh, thematic layers at various scales, 50,000 to 250,000, which can be directly used for your particular study. So one layer which is of particular interest uh, for the water source management is the uh, irrigation. 
that how many uh, canals are there in a particular command area how much area uh, on that uh, irrigation scheme is uh, able to do the irrigation so all uh, that uh, data set is available in the isro bhuvan website under the accelerated irrigation benefit uh, program funded by the world bank and you can see the progress of this uh, programs as well as uh, any gap area and uh, what are the areas which are uh, irrigated now uh, just uh, uh, to cover the basics if you want to estimate the surface water uh, generally uh, we uh, use the indices known as normalized difference water index where we have the blue band or uh, because blue will have high uh, atmospheric uh, impact so if you do not have the blue band we usually use the green band which is lesser impacted uh, by the atmospheric uh, effects so this positive value will be for the water and sometimes uh, the hill shadows uh, they also uh, uh, classified uh, as a surface water so to avoid this uh, we make uh, use of the uh, slope and the digital elevation model to uh, remove uh, this uh, shadow area as the water pixels so once you make these corrections the correct surface water which will include lakes rivers and the man made reservoirs and uh, that will be covered so similarly this is one example of a tihri dam uh, when the pre uh, during construction when the dam was being constructed at uh, confluence of bilangana and bhagirathi river and uh, in 2006 it was filled so this surface water extent uh, can be mapped uh, easily and finally we have to make the layer uh, where we have to subset and remove the extra pixels from this one so this full time series of the uh, 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 water uh, extent uh, can be uh, analyzed this is one example where uh, this is linked with the uh, reservoir sedimentation studies uh, where uh, we get the water level either from the reservoir authority and uh, we get the surface water extent uh, from the satellite data uh, and here uh you can uh, now use optical as well as uh, radar uh, uh, that is synthetic aperture radar images to get the uh, water extent uh, every month or every 15 days so this uh, water level from the satellite authorities uh, or the government authorities or the satellite altimetry as i will show in the coming slides so this uh, water level and water extent both can be derived from the remote sensing and once you use the trapezoidal formula you can estimate the revised uh, reservoir capacity versus the elevation curves and the difference between these two uh, curves will give you the loss of storage capacity and this loss of uh, storage capacity is directly result of the sedimentation so with this uh, you can estimate the uh, rate of siltation in the reservoir so this is the operational uh, approach and uh, this has been implemented uh, for all the major and the big reservoirs of india uh, where uh, apart from the limited hydrographic survey remote sensing approach is used operationally to estimate the rate of siltation in the satellites now uh, apart from the surface water if you have the hyperspectral remote sensing data you can use this data with the ground observation and you can uh, uh, correlate the reflectance uh, in a water body with the amount of turbidity suspended sediments or other water quality parameters which are optically active to derive the uh, uh, information over the entire lake area or the river area this example uh, shows the uh, uh, turbidity map for the chilka lake in terms of ntu units using the correlation using the spectral angle mapper uh, derived for the every ng satellite data uh, with the uh, field observed uh, spectra uh, of the uh, various locations in the chilka lake similarly uh, uh, apart from the surface water when uh, precipitation will happen as a snow the higher reaches will get the snow fall so snow also need to be mapped because uh, the uh, example of tihri from where the water will come into tihri so tihri will get the snow melt runoff which is coming from the bhagirathi basin similarly you have the satluj basin and other uh, uh, basins so the water in the bhakra dam is coming from uh, satluj basin and there is a uh, pong reservoir in kangra uh, district so that water is coming from the pyas river basin so pyas river you have lot of snow 
so in the spring time lot of uh, melting will take place and that filling of the reservoir will take place so both contribution of the monsoonal uh, rainfall induced runoff plus uh, melting from the snow uh, contributes to the replenishment of these reservoirs so you can see in the multispectral data in a particular uh, glaciated area this is a september image of the uh, sentinel 2 where you can see these glaciers uh, as a uh, cyan color in the uh, and here combination of uh, swir uh, nir and red is used uh, other than uh, traditional fcc of nir red and green and here this is the debris uh, over the main gangotri glacier and these are the tributary glaciers of chaturangi uh, and raktavaran this is kirti glacier this side we have the kedarnath this side we have the uh, bhagirathi and satopan glacier and badrinath somewhere here so uh, this uh, multi temporal remote sensing will give you information about the health of the glacier plus the dynamics of the snow so this information uh, uh, can be derived uh, automatically using the indices known as the normalized reference uh, snow index and which is uh, ratio of uh, reflectance uh, uh, green minus uh, nir and in the uh, snow case uh, the minimum reflectance is taking place in swir band 1.5 1.9 to 2 and 2.4 micrometer and very high reflectance is up to 80% uh, in the visible domain and this is uh, reverse as compared to the water in water we have only reflectance in 0.4 to 0.8 here but in the snow it is reverse so uh, the total uh, uh, high reflectance in the visible and minimum in the sphere band so this uh, will give the water and one more collection we have to make because uh, this indices will uh, give positive values for surface water bodies so one more uh, correction we have to make uh, that means uh, in the uh, uh, nir band the reflectance should be more than uh, 10 to uh, 20% uh, so in the snow case it will be more than 10 to 20% but in case of the surface water it will be less than 5% so this water bodies can be removed if you use that uh, criteria so this operationally every 6 days uh, to 8 days it can be uh, mapped and from isro every 15 days snow cover it is available uh, from isro bhuvan website at, at uh, this uh, 3 minutes interval for entire himalayan region using the multi uh, criteria decision uh, rule that has been uh, given in the uh, nicis portal of uh, bhuvan isro so uh, uh, apart from this uh, uh, there are global uh, remote sensing satellites like uh, uh, aqua and terra where we have the sensor uh, called uh, modis m o d i s and it gives the two uh, times uh, image in a wide swath and uh, that can be used to generate the a daily and daily uh, snow cover map and this is just one example where because uh, it is optical data so it can also uh have the impact of the cloud cover so that can be removed by the temporal uh, stacking and then um, using this particular uh, filter and you can generate the full time series from 2000 to uh, onwards and uh, similarly in these days google earth engine is very popular so in that uh, uh, during the cloudy conditions so we have the advantage of using the radar imaging satellites earlier we had the uh, re- our indian radar imaging satellites now we have the freely available sentinel series of the imaging uh, satellites so every 12 days uh, using google earth engine you can also map the dry and wet snow cover and apart from the snow cover uh, if you use the if rose uh, scatsat data which is working at the ku band these the previous satellites uh, they are working in the c band whereas uh, our scatsat it works in the ku band so in the ku band uh, the interaction with the snow is much more uh, higher as compared to the c band where interaction with the ground surface is higher as compared to the snow band so this uh, ku band on the weekly basis you can use it to estimate the change in the snow water equivalent in the uh, himalayan region snow water equivalent is nothing but the multiplication of depth of snow with the density of the snow and then you can monitor the health of the glaciers uh, using these uh, radar imaging satellites uh, because in the um, monsoon or in the winter they will be covered with the cloud cover so here you can use the multi temporal uh, composites to estimate the various uh, glacial radar zones 
which can be uh, inferred to uh, get accumulation, ablation, and transitional fern zones. And then once you club it with the elevation, you can estimate the fern line elevation uh, plus the uh, snow line and the equilibrium line altitude, which can give you the health of the glaciers. Then you can estimate the velocity also from the feature tracking and interferometry, uh, how fast uh, or the slow the glacier uh, is moving. So if the glacier is moving very fast, that means uh, it is uh, having a lot of mass and uh, positive mass balance is there. If it is uh, velocity has reduced over the time, that means it has reduced its uh, mass uh, for the same uh, slope. So they also give the indirect indication of the health of the glacier. So that can be monitored using the remote sensing. Then there are hydrological cycle components like precipitation, interception, uh, infiltration, evapotranspiration, uh, soil moisture and terrestrial water storage, uh, water level, uh, which can be estimated directly and uh, runoff, which is we estimate indirectly using the remote sensing data. So traditionally, uh, we have the point-based rainfall data. So these are the, some of the uh, interpolation methods like the inverse distance weighted the isohydral uh, nearest neighbor or Thyssen polygon uh, methods, uh, which can be used to estimate the spatially uh, rainfall. And the same uh, techniques have been used uh, with the IMD data where the 0.25 gradient rainfall has been generated. This is one more example of uh, spatially distributed rainfall for Uttarakhand using the IDW method. Now, uh, there are uh, operational satellites uh, which will give you the rainfall. The first dedicated satellite was Tropical Rainfall uh, Measuring Mission uh, launched with the NASA and JAXA, that is the US and Japanese space agency. So it gave uh, plus minus 35 degree latitude uh, every three hourly rainfall plus the daily rainfall at 0.25 degrees. So these are some of the examples here. And then a follow up of this mission is the Global Precipitation uh, Mission where we have the core satellites with the two precipitation uh, radars uh, 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 with the two frequencies and then the passive micro uh, sensors are there uh, which uh, uh, ranges from 10 gigahertz to 180 gigahertz covering the liquid form of the precipitation to the solid form of the precipitation and uh, these uh, 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 satellites because these are polar orbiting satellites uh, they cannot give you the uh, daily data so to because the precipitation is a, a event based instantaneous kind of uh, uh, event uh, and then it can have the duration of two hours three hours or sometimes 24 hours so if you want to give the 24 hour daily rainfall data you have to make use of the other satellites so these are the other satellites including india's megatropics uh, plus some geostationary and polar orbiting satellites uh, which will give us the total uh, rainfall at uh, uh, 10 kilometer resolution, which is improvement from TRMM, which was at 25 kilometer resolution, three hours. And this data is available at every half an hour for entire uh, globe. And latitude range is also higher, up to uh, 45 uh, degree latitude you can uh, cover, or up to uh, 60 degree latitude you can cover here. Then the second one is the soil moisture. The operationally, we have this uh, uh, passive microwave soil moisture, which will uh, give us the surface uh, soil moisture up to 15 centimeters. Uh, here it is an example of 2009, where we can see the dark blue as the moist or the wet conditions and the red as the dry conditions. So this kind of information is available on the daily basis, freely available. And uh, then there was a dedicated mission for the soil moisture ASMOS uh, from European Space Agency and soil moisture active and passive where uh, both active and passive sensors were used uh, to derive the soil moisture. So uh, this sensor worked for 2015 only, but now radar uh, is not working, only the radiometer is working. But uh, this radar is being uh, filled uh, with the Sentinel series of the satellites to give the high resolution uh, uh, combined uh, soil moisture. So this uh, data sets, uh, basic data set can also be derived to derive the uh, level four uh, soil moisture, which is very important for irrigation water management. That is root zone soil moisture up to one meter. So these are the additional uh, data sets which can be derived from these uh, satellite data products. Then uh, the evapotranspiration where uh, directly uh, we are not ma measuring it, but what we are measuring is the evaporative fraction. So here uh, we use the net radiation ground heat flux and the sensible uh, heat flux to estimate the latent heat flux that is your uh, 
uh, evapor transpiration and we make use of the thermal data uh, from the remote sensing satellites plus meteorological information land use land cover information to get the uh, this uh, daily evapor transpiration uh, for a particular given area provided we have the cloud free image uh, with the thermal data and uh, some of these uh, energy balance models they have been made operational in the google earth uh, 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 this one uh, so this uh, in the real time you can uh, this is the uh, ee flux uh, if you have the uh, this particular code you can calculate the uh, et for your particular area using the landsat uh, data sets and then there are uh, operational ET products also, which are available at kilometer scale uh, using this Sebastian Sun uh, model uh, and plus uh, combination of uh, uh, metric model. So this uh, is available uh, using Modis data and it is available from 2003 onwards at one kilometer scale. And uh, because both soil moisture and uh, ET, they contribute to the management of the irrigated and agriculture area. So the, in summary, for the irrigation uh, water management, it can be used for the site suitability, design of the irrigation system, progress monitoring as I told in the EIPP, then crop uh, uh, water requirements, uh, stress identification, whether biotic or abiotic, then environmental degradation, degradation and the performance evaluation of the irrigation projects. So these are some of the uh, applications uh, uh, where remote sensing is used extensively. And then the fourth portion uh, is your uh, surface runoff estimation where uh, traditionally we use the SCS curve number method which is dependent upon the land use land cover and the soil map. And once we get the curve number using the input rainfall data, we can estimate the potential runoff uh, zones. And once we know the, this runoff so that uh, combined with the routing models, we can estimate the river discharge as well. And uh, there is a, a one more technique which has uh, um, become uh, very popular among the community uh, that is altimeters uh, which were primarily designed uh, for uh, water level estimation in the oceans and long term climatic records uh, for the water level because the uh, climate change people say the water level in the ocean will rise due to melting of the glaciers or due to the uh, swelling of the ocean so even if uh, it rises by few centimeters it can uh, impact the coastal communities so those algorithms were refined uh, so that uh, uh, we can get the water level in the inland waters also for example reservoirs and rivers so this is one example for the Nianukai uh, reservoir where we can uh, see we have generated the longer time series of 25 years starting from 97 to uh, 2018 uh, and uh, this accuracy of this time series has progressively increased from the ERS-1, ERS-2 altimeters to the uh, Sentinel-3, Sentinel-3A, 3B uh, altimeters, including uh, several Altica datasets, so which is available uh, repeated uh, orbits from 2013 to 2016. And uh, this data is also used for the discharge estimation uh, because uh, these uh, tracks are fixed. So once I get the water level with the XD and I can uh, correlate that water level with the rating curve and I calibrate the water level which is derived from the XD model with the water level derived from the altimeter. Once that water level is calibrated, uh, I can do the continuous simulation using XD model. And then for each of these tracks, uh, I can estimate the discharge. So these sites are known as the virtual gauging sites. So once these rating curves are established, this is the simplest uh, but most effective method uh, wherever uh, we want to estimate the discharge from the uh, satellite-based altimeters, provided this rating curve is stable. It doesn't change uh, much uh, with the time. Uh, similarly, there is a terrestrial water storage, as I told initially, it is used for the closing the water balance uh, models also. So the continuously changes, for example, in so that is used for the uh, hydrological modeling components, drought analysis, glacier mass balance uh, detection. So all these applications can be utilized uh, using this gravity uh, anomaly based uh, data sets. And uh, geospatial inputs uh, for the hydrological modeling, for example, if you want to uh, generate the time series uh, from the uh, hydrological models, that is water balance components. So you need the basic topographical data. So as I told, from the remote sensing, uh, the various DEMs have been derived. For example, SRDM, 
cartodium, aster, merit hydro. Now, latest DEM is uh, Copernicus DEM or the tandem X DEM, which has been generated uh, using the uh, tandem series of the satellites. So, these the elevation will give us the slope, aspect, flow direction, drainage network, and all these uh, inputs. And meteorological data, as I told, uh, uh, rainfall, temperature, radiation will be derived from the satellites and for the land surface. A land is land cover from the optical soil moisture from the passive microwave thermal data will give you the uh, modis and oli and that core data uh, will be used to get evapotranspiration so this uh, data set will be integrated into the hydrological models so for example this is the mountainous catchment where the snow melt and rainfall are not contributing to the river flow that can be monitored similarly in the flood forecasting scheme also you can have the input rainfall data how much runoff uh, generated at the end of the river for example the ganges river coming here in the haridwar and from haridwar downstream how this inundation will take place so the accurate tm plus the accurate uh, rainfall uh, and the correction uh, catchment characteristics will be able to give that information so all this data uh, can be further assimilated to improve the accuracy of the hydrological uh, modeling, whether we derive from optical or the microwave data. And uh, this data, as I told, uh, this uh, in the upper reaches, we use the energy balance or the temperature index based snow melt runoff models. And uh, in case of the uh, hydrometeorological disaster, for example, snow avalanches, uh, this is an example of the RUMS uh, model where the high resolution digital elevation model and uh, uh, snow depth derived from the meteorological forcing uh, was used for the MSP7. Uh, in, that is, uh, when we go from Solang to Rotang Tunnel, there is a big uh, snow avalanche site that is known as Snow Gallery. So, those kind of simulations can be done. And uh, if you want to integrate this uh, for the operational flood forecasting, so uh, for the meteorological forecast, also you use uh, the digital elevation model, land is land cover. So those data sets are also derived from the remote sensing uh, and they are derived from various domains whether we use our internal in-house developed uh, forecast model or from 2019 onwards we are using the IMD forecasted uh, rainfall at 3 km. So all these inputs uh, will be used uh, in the next step to generate the flood hydrograph. This is one example where we have uh, established the uh, rainfall runoff models for Ganga Basin, uh, Satluj Basin, Bias Basin, Jhelum, and the Yamuna Basin. So the forecasted rainfall is used with these uh, models, uh, which are calibrated at the uh, upstream sites. And then uh, based on the uh, simulated hydrographs, uh, uh, they will be uh, further studied for the inundation modeling. So this is the multi-network uh, hydrodynamic model for the upper Ganga Basin where this inflow is coming from the hydrological models and then once uh, this uh, hydrograph uh, uh, is acting as a boundary condition we added this into the hd model to get the uh, probable inundation and uh, from 2019 uh, 18 onwards the central water commission is also forecasting this water level and uh, river flows so the same has been compared here for example for the yamuna basin so this is available for next three days. Our forecast is also available for three days. So this is our forecast. This is the CWC forecast for next three days. So this kind of uh, uh, inputs uh, can be uh, used uh, for uh, operational flood forecasting in purpose also. And one example uh, of the urban flooding, because all major cities of India, whether it is Dehradun, Jaipur, Chennai, Hyderabad, uh, Lucknow, Delhi, all these, they have seen the tremendous uh, urbanization in last uh, 30, 40 years. So you can see here 1972 core urban area was the only this much area that is 4.2 square kilometer by 2016. Uh, it has increased to 40, uh, 64 square kilometers. So if you increase the urbanized area, it will put uh, pressure on the urban drainage system in terms of reducing the infiltration, increasing the surface runoff. Uh, and also there is an increased pressure on the urban drainage system because uh, the width is constrained and a lot of solid waste is going into the stream. So when we have a heavy rainfall of 50 millimeters uh, per hour for two hours, uh, for example, in 12th of July 2017, so entire city was flooded uh, with this kind of flash flood for two hours. 
and then uh, if you do on daily basis the flood peak will be 120 if you do the uh, on uh, three hourly or hourly basis the flood peak uh, goes up to 400 meter cubes per second so these kind of flash floods so even though dehradun is a, a sloping city that means it is a natural having the natural slope it should not have the inundation but still if you have such a high intensity rainfall uh, and the urban drainage system is choked uh, with the uh, this kind of uh, narrow widths of the this two rivers that is Vishna river and the Bindal river so that can also uh, cause the urban flooding in, uh, in these areas then there are some examples of interlinking uh, Krishna reservoir and value guru reservoir uh, examples of uh, Andhra uh, and the Telangana so where interlinking has been used and monitored and any future projects where you want to do the interlinking basically you should have the environmental clearance that how much forest area uh, human settlements agriculture area so those has to be taken whether you are putting the pipeline or whether you are putting a canal system so those kind of uh, studies uh, uh, how much change in the land use how much slope is there how much uh, water can be carried uh, safely so all these studies can be integrated uh, studies can be done using the remote sensing based uh, platforms and uh, one of the dedicated satellites which is the nasa Astro satellite mission which have the three major objectives of the biosphere cryosphere and the solid earth so they have a very strong component on the monitoring of the snow glaciers and ice sheet plus because it is interferometric mission so it will also monitor the changes in the uh, subsidence levels and the groundwater withdrawal is one of the major reasons of the changes in the subsidence so that can also be uh, monitored using this NISA data and then uh, these are some of the satellites including our uh, ISRO's uh, satellites uh, that is inside uh, series uh, geostationary uh, satellites in the high resolution uh, then we have resource set uh, uh, three series of satellites uh, uh, where it will be constellation of missions like the sentinel missions where you can get less than five to uh, two days uh, repetitivity and apart from this we have the Trishna mission which will be the Indo-French mission uh, having the thermal sensors uh, which will be uh, boon for the uh, agriculture water management studies so those kind of missions are there which will help us to better quantify the water which is available uh, in various parts of the uh, uh, surface uh, atmosphere or uh, the groundwater and uh, the high resolution high spatiotemporal data will give us the better control uh, and monitoring capabilities of our uh, water whether it is in uh, command area or whether it is in reservoirs or even for the high uh, mountain uh, glaciers uh, or the uh, uh, mountainous region where these mountain hazards are also uh, big uh, cause of worry due to this uh, changing uh, climate so uh, high resolution spatial temporal data at uh, more uh, frequency and various electromagnetic part, uh, various spectrum of the electromagnetic uh, waves uh, uh, this will be launched and uh, uh, that will help us to uh, better monitor our water sources and uh, reduce the uncertainties in the current uh, techniques uh, and with this uh, i complete uh, my lecture and if you have some questions uh, we can take up